nine things very quickly, and I have to scoot through them so that we can, uh, of things that we see going on in the world that we think are critically important from a marketing point of view and that take in digital in emerging markets or digital and emerging markets. The, and the first thing is the obvious thing is this shift in the balance of power. I mean, we, we are basically betting the ranch, and I shouldn't say this as the CEO of a listed company with a market cap of $17 billion, uh, but we are betting the ranch on, on that strategy of new markets, new media, consumer insight data, application of technology, and horizontality. But the, the, what the, the key trend, you know, everything comes down to technology and geography at the end of the day. Everything that you think about, every problem you have, every opportunity you have, I think, comes down to those two issues, geography and technology. And they sort of permeate the nine things I'm going to mention. But geography is, is probably the most critical. It's the Jim O'Neill shift in the balance of power from west to east. The second thing we see is significant overcapacity in every industry virtually every industry that we work in. What's happened is that the Chinese, the Indians, the South Koreans, Hyundai, you know, the Samsung of the car industry in my view, have built, started to build capacity to match the decline in the US. Most industries we see similar, similar situation. Overcapacity is still the issue. So what we do in our industry, what most 70% of this audience do, according to the statistics at the beginning, is of critical importance. Differentiation of products and services of corporate brands and product brands is absolutely critical in an overcapacity situation. So you have this paradox that there's oversupply in terms of production, but there's undersupply in terms of talent. So that's the second thing. Third thing is the web. And that the web disintermediates traditional businesses. It disintermediates them with a lower cost business model and institutional investors and VCs and private equity companies tend to look at them differently than to legacy companies. They always look at volume and hits or the equivalent of circulation, not at profit and margins, which is they look at in terms of us. And they steal your people. People like to work in smaller companies, less bureaucratic companies, technologically advanced companies. So looping back to that talent question or point, Technology companies, web-based companies, are much more attractive in terms of attracting people, particularly out of universities and design schools and art schools and film schools. Fourth area is retail. I don't have to tell you in Australia the power of retail. Tesco, Carrefour, Walmart are all putting pressure on manufacturers around the world because of their strength at the retail level and also because of the, some of the challenges that each of those companies is going through at the moment. That's putting tremendous pressure on the manufacturers. And, and when you look at the last 20 years, you go back to 1990, there's been very little price inflation at the consumer level. So our clients, by and large, our manufacturing clients, have very little pricing power with consumers. And you've had an increase in commodity prices, at least until recently, which has put pressure on our clients, manufacturers, internally pressures on their margins. In that situation, it's quite understandable with little pricing power that they put pressure on costs, on their supply chain, and on us in our industry. Next point is global and local. We're trying to organize ourselves globally, as I've mentioned, also locally. I've talked about the country managers. It's no good multinationals are believing that they can sit in London or Paris or New York or Washington and run relatively complex organizations from the center. There has to be this balance between global and local. The squeeze inside corporate organizations, I think, will come at the regional level, and you'll have global and local organizations much more. Internal communications is the sixth point. The biggest challenge facing chairman and CEOs is explaining internally what they're doing, strategically and structurally. That's the big issue. David Ogilvy was exactly right explaining internally what you're doing and you get your people on side who communicate externally to suppliers, to government, to journalists, to trade associations, et al., what you're trying to do. So internal communication is absolutely critical, very difficult to do, as I say, 
in a company like ours that's grown by acquisition and is multi-branded. The seventh point is, and, and uh, this is really important, and I'm saying this to an audience, particularly the 70% here in the ab advertising industry, we, we are not as important an industry today as we were several years ago. And finance and procurement has become, inside corporations, much more powerful than marketing. And that's a mistake. Two final points and then I'll stop. Government. Those of you who think that the government is going to recede, think again. Despite what Draghi said yesterday, despite what may happen after the US election in terms of dealing with the US deficit, government is going to be with us uh, as a client, as a regulator, as an intervener, I think for a substantial period of time. And the last point you'll be delighted to know is corporate social responsibility. Um, five, ten years ago, if I was trying to make this speech, it was certainly there would be a lot of greenwashing going on. Corporates would believe they paid lip service to issues of CSR. That's gone. And fundamentally, if I look at our biggest clients, whether it's Ford, or Unilever, or Procter & Gamble, or Kraft, or Nestle, or Kellogg's, uh, or whoever. Corporate social responsibility is front and center for their strategy. And it's a, a core part of what they do. It's not a nice to have a department at the center. It's front and center to what they do. So, uh, and if I quote what John Brown of, of BP, the former Lord Brown, chairman and uh, former CEO of BP said in 19, I think it was 99 at Stanford Business School, doing good is good business. People finally understand that if you improve the lot of your stakeholders and you're in the business of building brands and products and services, which we are for the long term, doing good is good business. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.